We've finally reached the end of the story about the three Chinese astronauts who got stuck in space. So today, we are wrapping things up by answering the remaining questions. What really happened to the spacecraft? Whether they're going home safely? And, most importantly, what happens next? Every Shenzhou mission to Tiangong wraps up with a handover. The departing crew greets the newly arrived Taikonauts, who will take over day-to-day -day operations of the space station. For a few days, both Shenzhou spacecraft are docked at Tiangong, while everyone settles in and transfers responsibilities. Shenzhou 21, launched on 31st of October 2025, carried three Taikonauts to the station. It's the 16th crewed Chinese spaceflight, the 21st Shenzhou mission overall, and marks the 10th crew rotation for Tiangong. But things didn't go quite as planned on the morning the previous crew was supposed to return home. The China Manned Space Agency, CMSA, announced that Shenzhou 20 may have been struck by a small piece of space debris, forcing a delay in the crew's trip back to Earth. CMSA hasn't shared exactly what went wrong or where the issue is located. Well, until now. According to state-run Xinhua, the Shenzhou 20 spacecraft does not meet the requirements for the astronauts' safe return and will remain in orbit to continue relevant experiments. They added that tiny cracks were discovered in the return capsule's viewport window, likely caused by an external impact from space debris. Shenzhou is built in three sections, a forward orbital module, the re-entry module in the middle, and a service module at the back. The idea behind this layout is simple. Only the re-entry module needs to survive the fiery plunge back to Earth. That means the orbital and service modules don't need heavy heat shielding, which saves weight and frees up more usable space inside the spacecraft. This is why the cracks found in the re-entry capsule are such a serious issue. It's the only part of Shenzhou that actually returns to Earth, and re-entry is one of the most brutal phases of any mission. The capsule's design is already a compromise. It has to be roomy enough for the crew, but also shaped in a way that lets it maintain some aerodynamic control as it slams back through the atmosphere. The windows on the spacecraft have to endure the harsh realities of space, too. The panes are made from 80 specially crafted pieces of quartz glass, produced by a manufacturer in Qinhuangdao, in North China's Hebei province. Each piece goes through dozens of production steps before it's ready for use in space. They have to survive temperatures of up to 1,000 degrees Celsius, sudden and extreme temperature swings, strong radiation, and still let through more than 95% of visible light. So the fact that something strong enough to crack that glass hit the capsule really shows how dangerous space debris is. And it's not a rare problem. There are millions of pieces of mostly tiny debris orbiting Earth. They come from rocket launches, past collisions, and old satellites breaking apart. Each time something breaks up in orbit, all its fragments fly off in their own separate paths. We can analyze these paths as a kind of debris cloud, but individually, each piece is on its own orbit. And here's the scary part. You would never see space debris coming. Relative to a spacecraft or astronaut, debris hits at speeds roughly 10 times faster than a bullet, and many fragments are the size of a bullet or smaller. You can't see a bullet in flight, and definitely not something moving 10 times faster. When two objects collide in orbit, it doesn't look like a crash in slow motion. It looks more like both objects explode. At these extreme speeds, the objects pass through each other so quickly that the shock waves inside their structures don't have time to propagate before everything is already breaking apart. This shatters each object into fragments of different sizes, each piece kicked into a different direction. Every fragment then ends up in its own new orbit, drifting away according to orbital mechanics. With thousands of pieces spread out, the aftermath looks very much like an explosion. Anyway, even China has done a thorough evaluation of the situation. You know, with spacecraft, there are multiple layers of protection and different approaches to make sure everything stays safe during flight. So a crack in the window isn't actually a huge issue from a structural or mechanical standpoint. That said, there are still some unknowns. During the return to Earth, high pressure or high temperatures could cause the crack to grow, and that's not something you want to gamble on. Even if the window were to fail completely, there are backup protections in place to keep the astronauts safe. But, of course, no one wants to rely on those backups if they don't have to. So, in the end, it just makes the most sense for China to say, let's play it safe. 
and use a brand new spacecraft to bring the crew home. And that's exactly what they did. The three astronauts of China's Shenzhou-20 mission had left Tiangong and gone home on another spacecraft, the Shenzhou-21. Over the course of around six hours, the Shenzhou-21 spacecraft undocked from the Tianhe module's forward-facing port at the Tiangong space station at 11.14 a.m. China Standard Time, 3.14 a.m. Universal Coordinated Time, to move to a safe distance for return, first jettisoning the orbital module. After that, the service module performed the deorbit burn for itself and the re-entry capsule with the crew inside, separating afterward for re-entry. A feature in the landing system allows the use of a single parachute and braking rocket. Thus, the heat shield is dropped from the spacecraft, similar to the landing bag deployment on the U.S. Mercury spacecraft. The return capsule deployed a red and white striped parachute before coming down in the late afternoon at a remote site in the Gobi Desert, about five and a half hours after leaving the space station. Like the command module of the Apollo spacecraft, the Shenzhou re-entry capsule has no reusable capabilities. Each spacecraft is flown once and then thrown away. Commander Chen Dong, Chen Zhongrei, and Wang Jie have since exited the return spacecraft and appear to be in good health, having made a final parachute-aided descent to Earth's surface. They safely touched down on the Dongfeng landing site in China's Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region, shortly before 3.45 a.m. EST, 0845 GMT, on November 14th, after spending over six months in low Earth orbit aboard the Tiangong space station. Minutes after touchdown, recovery teams moved in on the re-entry capsule and helped each crew member out, along with the experiments they brought back. With this landing, Chen Dong has now spent a national record of 418 days in space across three missions. Wang Jie and Chen Dong have each logged 204 days in space during their first missions. Now that they're out of the spacecraft, the three Taikonauts will go through routine medical checks before heading to Beijing for more thorough post-mission evaluations and time to readjust to life back on Earth. This incident has created an awkward situation aboard the Tiangong space station. The three astronauts who launched on Shenzhou-21, Zhang Lu, Wu Fei, and Zhang Hongzhong, are still on the nearly 100 metric ton station, with only the damaged Shenzhou-20 available as their ride home. According to Yang Yuguang, chairman of the Space Transportation Committee at the International Astronautical Federation, China always maintains a backup spacecraft and a backup launch vehicle ready for possible rescue missions. That's why the Shenzhou-22 mission is so important. Even though the spacecraft and rocket aren't fully assembled yet, they're already standing in the vehicle assembly building. There are usually two preparation timelines, either about 8.5 days or 16 days, during which engineers can complete all the necessary tests and inspections for both the spacecraft and the Long March 2F rocket. These systems are extremely complex, with many subsystems that must be checked without exception to ensure a successful launch. It's a challenge, he said, but one China has trained and drilled for many times. He expects that within several days, Shinjo 22 will be ready for launch, and I think that might be their only option. A key complication is docking space. Tiangong's Tianhe core module has three docking ports, one at the front, one at the rear, and one underneath the node. All three are currently occupied by Shinjo 20, Shinjo 21, and the Tianjo 9 cargo craft. That means there's no free port for a new spacecraft. The best system-level solution is to bring the Shinjo 20 crew back to Earth using the fully intact Shinjo 21 spacecraft. That frees the front port, allowing Shinjo 22 to launch a few days later and dock there, as the China Manned Space Agency has announced. Yang explained that Shinjo 22, together with the Long March 2F Y-22 rocket, will be launched in a crewed-ready configuration, but with no astronauts. It will dock to the front port of the Tianhe module, where it will remain for about six months. Then, the Shinjo 21 crew will return to Earth using this newly docked spacecraft. After that, operations will go back to their regular rhythm. The original Shinjo 22 crew will now become the Shinjo 23 crew, and they'll fly to the station about six months later using the Shinjo-23 spacecraft. In the meantime, once Shinjo-22 has launched, China will accelerate the production and preparation of the Shinjo-23 vehicle and its Long March 2F rocket.
In the end, it really comes down to this. We need a better way to manage space debris. The International Space Station uses something called Whipple shields to protect itself. Most of the shielding can handle particles up to about 3 millimeters across. The idea is pretty clever. Multiple layers work together so that the first layer shatters an incoming object, the next layer breaks the fragments down even further, and by the time anything reaches the final layer, it's too tiny to do serious damage. Smart design, but it definitely has limits. If you want to stop bigger debris, you need thicker, heavier shields with more space between them. And at some point, they just get too heavy and bulky to launch. That's why the ISS can't be completely protected from every piece of debris that's too small to track, but still big enough to be dangerous. That's where space tracking networks step in. The U.S. Space Surveillance Network, SSN, run by the U.S. Air Force, uses radar and optical sensors around the globe to keep an eye on what's orbiting Earth. They can track anything softball-sized or larger in low Earth orbit, and anything roughly basketball-sized out in geosynchronous orbit. With that data, the SSN can predict close approaches, possible collisions, and when objects will re-enter the atmosphere. Other countries, including China, run their own tracking systems too, all contributing to a broader effort to keep space as safe as possible. Some radar systems can detect tiny objects passing through their beams, but they can't track them long enough to figure out their orbits. So, scientists estimate how many small debris pieces are out there by counting those quick radar hits and extrapolating from them. But that's about as far as we can go. We can't control inactive objects. We also can't do anything about objects that are active but unable to maneuver, like the Hubble Space Telescope. And even when a satellite can maneuver, it's not as easy as telling a plane to turn left or climb 1,000 feet. Satellites follow the laws of orbital physics, and changing their path takes time, fuel, and a lot of advance warning. There's no easy or cheap fix for the space debris problem. Cleaning it all up will cost a lot and take years. The big stuff, like spent rocket stages, is the most dangerous because it can create even more debris. But it's also heavy and hard to move. The small stuff is everywhere, can still cause serious damage, and is incredibly hard to find. Still, if we want to keep expanding our presence in space, we're going to have to figure out a way to deal with it.